you know, in this uh, session, on, this is the, th the session on network uh, theory. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Ricardo Molo, and as you see the title already in the screen, uh, the title is The Synchronization Dynamics on Non-Normal Networks. So you may start, Ricardo. Okay, thank you very much. So, hi everyone, I'm Ricardo from University of Namur. And today I will talk to you about synchronization dynamics in non-normal networks. So before I start, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference for giving me the opportunity to present our work and also our funding sources, in particular, the Walloon region who's paying for my PhD scholarship. And of course, my collaborator, Professor Carletti, my supervisor here in Namur and Professor Gleason and Dr. Aslani uh, in Limerick, Ireland. So um, synchronization is a widespread phenomenon observed in many natural and artificial systems for, from the classic uh, synchronization of metronomes to the synchronization of uh, firing neuron during uh, an epileptic seizure. And this phenomenon was uh, first studied uh, rigorously uh, by Dutch physicist Christian Hawkins in the 17th century. And since then it has become a very active uh, field of research. With, applic with applications ranging from uh, health to power grids. And in this field, a milestone was set by Pecora and Carroll, who published a great paper at the end of the late 90s, where they introduced uh, the master stability function. This is a, a numerical tool allowing, uh, allowing us to compute the maximum Lyapunov exponent for each value of the coupling. So here we show an example for the Rossler oscillator, which is a three species uh, model with diffusive coupling. And uh, so uh, we see that, uh, so we, we studied it in a chaotic regime. So the Lyapunov exponent of the uncoupled system is positive. Then we have a convex region where the uh, master stability function is negative. So we have stability, we have synchronization. And then we have a region where the mass stability function is positive. So after a perturbation, the system will lose synchronization. Our systems are on networks. So the master stability function is discrete. We have a finite number of possible instability state. And now we can uh, exploit the fact that the, the region is convex and just play with the, with the coupling by fixing the parameters of the model in order to obtain a case where the system uh, synchronizes. And we didn't touch the parameters, we just acted on the coupling strength and the coupling matrix. So one question we can ask is, how do we design networks uh, that are uh, optimal for synchronization? Well, Motter and Ishikawa answered about 15 years ago in two papers where they proved a theorem stating that networks of this kind with a, the directed uh, tree structure, with the uh, hierarchical structure, without feedback loops, and with non-diagonalizable coupling are optimal for synchronization. So we started from this point and we studied the Brasselator model that is a two species system. So we don't have the chaotic regime. We have a limit cycle regime. That is the one we are interested in because we studied oscillators uh, and also a fixed point regime that in principle is not interesting for us, but as we are about to see, it can be very interesting. And we study this system with diffusive coupling uh, on a network that is uh, called circulant. So it's a bidirected uh, ring. We have epsilon that is a parameter varying from uh, one. So the network is symmetric and zero. As soon as epsilon is uh, less than one, the network is asymmetric. Now, if we compute uh, the master stability function, we see that for a given setting of the, of the parameters, the um, symmetric case is stable, but as we introduce a symmetry by lowering the weight of the return links, we reach the instability region. So the system loses synchronization. Now we know that the spectrum of a, a symmetric network is real, but when the, the network is asymmetric, the spectrum is in principle complex. And if we project the master stability function in the complex plane, we see that it's the imaginary part due to the asymmetry in the network, in the topology, who is pushing the system towards the region where the Lyapunov exponent is positive. 
area that we region that we depicted in uh, in magenta. So this network is not very good for synchronization. We lose it, we lose um, stability uh, as soon as we introduce a symmetry. Now, as I, as I said before, the master stability function is a numerical tool. So in our case, with the limit cycle, we can perform only numerically the linear stability analysis. And here, show an example of uh, a master stability function uh, computed numerically. However, we can average the Jacobian matrix over the, uh, the period. So from a non-autonomous system, whose stable state is a stable limit, uh, is a limit cycle, we obtain an autonomous system whose stable state is a fixed point. And this approximation was studied by Brown and Rulkoff and then by the group of Duccio Fanelli in Florence. Now, having this uh, stable state uh, that is a fixed point, we can compute the master stability function analytically. Now, in, usually in the literature, in this framework is called dispersion relation, but it's a master stability function. So from a non-autonomous system, we have an autonomous system, system that is way easier to study. And remarkably, for a certain range of parameters, these two master stability functions almost coincide. We can even do better than that, but then you would not see the difference between the, the two curves. Uh, so we can use the analytical results that have been developed in these two papers for the case of fixed points and then apply them for the case or limit cycle. So we can have an analytical description, even in a setting when in principle, uh, we cannot uh, do anything analytically, but we only can use numerical tools. Going back to the network, I said that uh, bi bidirected ring is not the best uh, setting to study synchronization. So let us now remove two links. So those connecting node N to node I obtaining then a, a bidirected chain. Again, epsilon can vary between one and zero. And when it's one, the network is symmetric. But this kind of network has an addition symmetric matrix that is tridiagonal. And also the Laplacian, so the, the diffusive coupling matrix is tridiagonal. And tridiagonal matrix matrices have uh, real spectra. So even when the network is directed, is asymmetric, we still have a real spectrum. So now if we compute the master stability function, we see that even though we, we can vary ep epsilon as we want, but we don't have anymore the imaginary part pushing the system towards instability. So this, for example, was computed for epsilon equal 0 0.1. So it seems that indeed it is a good setting for uh, to, to, study, to study synchronization because we seem to be stable. However, uh, as soon as epsilon is less than one, the network is non-normal. Non-normality can be described mathematically as a non-commutation between the, uh, the matrix and its transposed. There are a few equivalent definitions for those who like linear algebra. And in the context of network, they have been studied in the last years because it was found in this paper that most of real world networks are non-normal. So it is extremely interesting for, uh, for modeling to study this, uh, this setting. And non-normal matrices and also operator, operators have been found to be more reactive to perturbation. So we, we say technically that their pseudo spectrum, so their perturbed spectrum is bigger uh, if compared to their um, normal analogous. And the perturbed spectrum, uh, spectrum grows with the non-normality. And this is known to have effects on the dynamics in the context of um, Turing pattern formation and also hydrodynamics. So now if we integrate the equations in this setting in which we seem to be stable, we see that the stable limit cycle once perturbed, um, this perturbation uh, propagates through the net, is amplified and then propagates through the nodes, destroying synchronization so even though we were supposed to be stable, at the end, we lose synchronization uh, and we end up in a, an homogeneous uh, state. Now, if we compute the, the pseudo spectrum, there is a Mat MATLAB toolbox called a tool developed in Oxford. Uh, we see that for the order of magnitude of the perturbation that we use, that is 10 to the minus one, we go into the instability region. So even though we don't have an imaginary part pushing the system towards 
instability, it's the perturbed spectrum that is unstable. And moreover, as we lower epsilon, so as we um, as we introduce more asymmetry, now it's not the imaginary part because the spectrum is real, but the pseudo spectrum goes deeper into the instability region. And we can calculate the non-normality of the network with reference to the Enrici index that is a classic measure of non-normality. And we see that in fact, as epsilon is uh, smaller, the non-normality increases with the limiting case uh, of epsilon equals zero. So no, uh, um, no return links, the network that seem to be optimal for synchronization. So the most optimal is also, also the most non-normal. And the lower is epsilon, the deeper we go into the instability region. Now, if we use the um, standard deviation as a proxy for synchronization, so standard deviation zero or close to zero indicates synchronization while standard deviation greater than zero indicates loss of synchronization. We see that for different values of epsilon starting from one, so symmetric network and increasing the non-normality, even though the master stability function predicts stability, the maximum Lyapunov exponent is negative, from a certain value of epsilon uh, on, we have loss of synchronization. So when the network is more non-normal, we always lose synchronization. And we can visualize this either in the phase space or with a potential uh, landscape. Uh, we can visualize this as a shrinking of the stable state based in of attraction as we depicted in uh, previous, uh, previous works. So the non-normality shrinks the uh, basin of attraction of the stable state. So wrapping up, uh, we need to be careful uh, when we design networks that are optimal for synchronization because the more the more optimal the more non-normal uh, and so we can lose synchronization even though the master stability function may fail in predicting uh, the stability of the system so we need to look for a trade-off between non-normality and optimality and with that just wanted to tell you that uh, our preprint is on the archive and I thank you for your attention and I will be happy to answer any question. Thank you, Ricardo, and thank you for being in time. And uh, we are open for questions. We have uh, plenty of time for this. Uh, I, I, can, uh, say, I can post a question and give also time to the participants to prepare questions if they have one. Uh, so you, you simply say that this master stability function does not work for non-normal uh, networks. It's not a signature yes. of, uh, of uh, synchronization. Yes, when the, the network is, uh, is strongly non-normal, it doesn't capture uh, this, uh, this effect because there is a transient growth. And then uh, when the system is linearized, it always goes to the stable state. But okay. then there is an interplay between the non-linearities and the eigenvector of the networks, and then it stabilizes in another state. So maybe there are also some other conditions uh, for the network, for the, uh, the matrix, the adjusted matrix, that can be normal, but they might be another structure of connections where the, uh, also this uh, mass stability function will not work. You only, you only check the case with the epsilon, that you change this epsilon, but you still get, uh, use this uh, chain structure there. Yes. What about if you, for example, use some other structure, like if you like, like break the, the chain or having like nodes, uh, having distant connections. Yeah. And so on. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I, I didn't say that. Thank you for the question. Uh, that was the simplest case of non-normal network. But there are many, many other cases. So as soon as the matrix, uh, the, the addition symmetry does not commune with its adjoint, we have this effect. So for example, a directed Barabasi-Albert model, that's also not normal. Yeah, we can, you can also have normal uh, adjusted matrices, but with other structure. Yes, of course. But when it's normal, uh, so we, we have a, a measure that we use in dynamics. It's the spectral abscissa, the um, numerical abscissa minus the spectral abscissa. And when this measure is zero, so for, a, for example, for a normal network, we never have the transient grow, growth. So okay. we cannot have this effect. Okay.
Thank you. So please, if there is any other question, I don't want to monopolize this discussion. Doesn't seem the case. I see here that there is a link. I guess this is for your your talk, eh? This link here in the archive. Oh the yes, archive. thanks, Brown. Yes, and you got a great talk. So uh, I would say thank you, Ricardo. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for the talk, and uh, we we proceed with the next talk. Uh, Philip Garnett is going to talk about an initial framework assessing the safety of complex systems. So, Philip, uh, you may uh, share the screen. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I actually recorded it, so I took that option. So I'll just. Uh, ah, okay. So uh, I'm not familiar how you do this. I, hopefully, it will work without you problems. You just play so. it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Go, go ahead and play it then. Okay. Hello everyone. Uh, first I'd like to uh, thank the organisers for giving uh, me the opportunity to present this work. Um, so my name is Philip Garnett and I'll be presenting uh, the team's work on uh, safer complex systems. So just give a little bit of background to this project. It was first uh, introduced as part of a larger project um, by the Royal Academy of Engineering at CCS 2019. And it's really a sort of uh, the next phase in their ongoing interest in addressing kind of uh, societal challenges or part of that part of that next phase. Uh, the work is supported by the Lloyd's Register Foundation and the Newton Fund and Engineering X started in late 2019, early 2020. And it has broad interest in uh, safe complex systems, which is uh, what our report was uh, focused on, but also safer end of engineering life, engineering skills where they are most needed, and transforming systems through partnership. So this project in particular was to develop initial framework for assessing the safety of complex systems. Um, so the kind of overarching question really was how can we assure the safety of socio-technical systems when they're becoming complex, or really more complex, I suppose, and um, so the, the sort of underlying premise was that a lot of engineered systems are uh, sort of displaying or, or have rather many more of the features that we associate with complex systems. So I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But uh, the, the framework itself was developed using a few different example domains, one being automated driving. And here you can obviously see that um, sort of complexity arises in that system through both the complexity of the car itself but also the way it interacts with transport infrastructure and society more generally. We also looked at complex aviation platforms like the 737 uh, Max. Um, that's a good example because I think you could make a case to say that that aircraft actually displayed um, emergent properties so that it had behaviors that you perhaps could not predict from an understanding of the parts of the aircraft and their interactions alone um, which which obviously then has quite significant implications for safety we also looked at healthcare infrastructures and then the example that will uh, I'll use a little bit in this talk uh, very briefly obviously is complex supply networks so the framework was designed to essentially raise awareness of the features of complex systems and the people that are uh, uh, responsible for design, engineering, and management of engineered systems. Um, so the hope was that it uh, will ensure the potential consequence of complexity or at least acknowledged or, or perhaps even mitigated where possible. And we break the framework down into three layers, so task and technical, management and governance. And I'll talk about those layers a little bit in a minute. So what do we mean by characteristics of complexity? None of these will be uh, new to anyone in this audience, um, but perhaps needed highlighting in certain sort of engineering contexts. Uh, so it's all the kinds of things you'd expect, things like emergent properties, semi-permeable boundaries. Here we use mode transitions where we're sort of talking about things like tipping points or critical transitions, because that's language that's uh, more, um, yeah, engineers are more aware of that kind of language, basically. But then we've got the other kind of features as well, like self-organization, systems inertia, feedbacks, etc. So 
By following the framework process and using the diagrams, um, it encourages the documentation of various different things, including things like exasperating factors that are important to the context in which the system is being used or deployed. So things like production pressures, causes of system complexity inherent to the system. So that might be something like stakeholder diversity. The consequences of that complexity, so perhaps competing objectives um, across those different domains. Uh, systemic failures, we could be something like unanticipated risks. And then we have things like uh, the, the sort of controls that could either be um, part of the problem or to mitigate the problem. So design time controls, e.g. redundant systems or operation time controls, so incident and accident analysis. They could both either be used to kind of mitigate complexity or the consequences of complexity, but also could obviously um, uh, be, a, be a cause of that as well. We break the, so this is sort of the big picture diagram. We break it down um, to, sort of, to sort of show how these things potentially feed into each other. This is not uh, to demonstrate a kind of linear path through the, the framework itself. Um, and actually, we do have a versions diagram which has more lines on it, but this one's quite quite nice because it's quite simple. So it shows that exasperating factors can feed into both causes of system complexity and consequences of system complexity, which may result in systemic failures. And similarly, design time controls and operation time controls can either kind of mitigate uh, causes or the consequences of the complexity or indeed contribute to it as well. When we're talking about causes, um, this is the sort of thing that we have in mind. So just to remind you that we have these three layers again. So governance layer, management layer, task and technical layer. So causes of complexity could be things like multiple ju jurisdictions or rapid technological change. Management issues might be things like no single owner, diversity of stakeholders and design and operation. And then task and technical could be things like interconnectivity and interdependency or perhaps environmental complexity and open systems. And then systemic failures, here we're sort of thinking about, again, split across these layers, sort of inappropriate uh, deployment decisions, inequitable risk distribution or accountability mismatch, or model mismatch and decision mismatch at the task and technical layer. So we did um, some work on the, an E. coli food contamination case study, and this is the sort of the big picture diagram that we developed through that process. So I don't really have time to go through this in, in too much detail, but you can see in the exasperating factors, we had things like globalization and responsibility for supply chain, perhaps even the way the supply chains are operated, if it's lean, failure of diagnosis diagnostic tests so even though the tests were in place they didn't work very well so the contamination was not detected and then different causes as well so multiple jurisdictions uh, management unable so consequences as well so things like management able to routinely monitor supply chain and then failures um, you know large scale of disruption supply and international bans and imports due to the inability to detect and isolate this this contamination. So you can see how a picture of this system can be built up. And then at the bottom here, we've got operation time controls as well. Um, so some of these are recommendations, some of these are contributing factors. We perhaps should have separated that a little bit. So a contributing factor might be um, whole supply chain monitoring systems are required but not present. And then perhaps something like no universal standards for the detail provided and information retained. So hopefully you can kind of see through this very quick example that by completing this series of diagrams, the engineers and domain experts responsible for a system across all the layers should have a better understanding of the safety implications of complexity in their system at the end of the process. And during the report writing itself, we were able to make a number of specific recommendations for the domains that we actually covered. Uh, so the example of supply networks, things like uh, the governance layer, for example, regulation needs to be able to look beyond the immediate time to incorporate potential future consequences of supply networks. The management level, information and registry guidance needs to be available to assist management with reconciling competing objectives. So that could be something like 
uh, maintaining operation of supply networks during resource constraints, but also maintaining the safety. And then at the te uh, task and technical, there should be perhaps technologies developed to help lower uncertainty in supply networks. There is a lot of future work that could be done um, in this area. And you know some of the things that we identified uh, during the process of developing the report uh, that we think could be kind of developed through further studies looking at specific domains. Uh, so you could look at things like investigation and safety of ad hoc systems or emergent design and development processes um, that spontaneously form around issues because obviously they're probably going to have a very different governance system from a kind of deliberate and planned engineering process. Also, in a little bit differently, um, things like what norms might need to be established to systemically embed safety into complex socio-technical systems development. Um, so a kind of complex systems view of safety that could be embedded into, uh, into these processes. The report itself will be available in early 2021. Um, that's the link, which is probably a bit hard to jot down. But if you search Engineering X Safer Complex Systems, you'll reach the kind of the part of the Royal Academy of Engineering website where the report will be hosted. So finally, just at the end, I'd like to thank Engineering X, obviously, for supporting and funding this work. And um, it is worth pointing out that this is just the beginning of a, uh, a continued pro program of work. So there will be more um, opportunities for funded research in this area of safety complex systems. And I think that's something worth highlighting to this audience. So thank you very much. And I uh, look forward to uh, answering any questions that you might have. Okay, thanks, uh, Philip, for this uh, recorded uh, talk. And uh, we are open to questions. If uh, anyone wants to open the microphone and uh, pose a question or write in the chat, there doesn't seem to be any text in the chat uh, for questions. I must say that this is out of my reach. Uh, it's not the topics that I. I'm aware so much of, but uh, if there is no question or until there is a question, since we have some time, if you could, uh, I don't know, Philip, if you can actually do this, but uh, if you can just pick up one of the topics that you had, like uh, diagnostic failure or model failure or whatever, and uh, tell us a little bit of how you deal with this. Yeah, or maybe it's, a, it's not a good question to, at this it, point. It's a good question. Um, so. It's, I think it's a bit of a funny one, really, because the report was designed to highlight the problems and not really present many solutions. Um, so just taking the, the complex supply chain networks as an example, it was more about suggesting that we need to spend a lot more time embedding the kind of knowledge that's available through things like complex networks analysis. Um, in the practice of management and governance of supply chains. Um, rather than, so our job, we only had three months to write this report. So our job wasn't really to, to kind of implement anything. But the reason why it's useful highlighting at places like here is that this is the, the first few months of a five year project with quite a lot of funding available. So it's really good to highlight it to a community like this to, to put it on people's radar essentially. Okay, so, so now we will have another topic to make a report on, uh, about the vaccination, the network uh, and the supply chains of vaccination. <laughs> that would be a new topic for you, I would guess. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of attention nowadays. <laughs> okay. Yeah, if there is any question, please go ahead. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is um, Lars Schillingstad. I uh, work with uh, Sintef Ocean, a marine research institute in Norway. So uh, you mentioned that Lloyd's Register was involved in this in some way. And uh, um, the marine sector is one of their uh, like big, big areas, right? Do you see, have you looked into any um, maritime uh, applications uh, here? Is that part of what you've been looking at? So the closest we got to maritime was automated shipping. 
So there's a big push towards, uh, well, the sort of automated vehicle equivalent of a, of a ship. Um, maybe not in its totality, but certainly in the kind of uh, the last, like the point of which ships dock into ports is an area of real interest. Um, and that obviously you can see that there's a lot of complexity in a situation like that and, and, and quite important safety concerns. But I mean, to, to, to sort of also go back to your, the kind of premise of your question is, Lloyds are interested in this in, in, a, in a very broad way, which is why they went reached out to the Royal Academy of Engineering. So I, I, would, uh, I would think they, they would definitely be interested in other aspects of maritime research as well. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks for the question and thanks for, uh, uh, for this round of uh, talks and questions. We, go, we move to the next one. The next talk is from uh, Marcus uh, Kirkilionis, if I could pronounce it correctly. So you may share the screen and uh, uh, go ahead with the talk, Marcus. Uh, you should also turn on your microphone. Yes, very good. Um, do you hear me now? Yes, we hear you now. Oh, okay, very good. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Go um, yeah. So I also have a pre-recorded lecture. So I hope I. Okay. Everything works. I have it on YouTube, so um, you should see it now. And I make it um, full screen in a moment. So what I want to talk. Do you see it? Yes, go ahead, please. You're aware, okay. Our importance okay. Um, to complex system science, it's a combination of um, the discussion of relational structures um, that go beyond pure graph theory and um, also stochastic processes that are defined on this uh, relational structure. So these are two fundamental questions from um, modeling, from mathematical modeling. Um, so taking, um, having a structural part, a static part. Maybe you should turn on your microphone a little bit um, higher. Yeah. With um, graph theory is that uh, it also mm -hmm. has only um, binary relationships um, to model with. So in many cases, as we will see, we need uh, N relations. And the second problem is uh, graph theory is not um, able to reflect multi-scale problems. And multi-scale problems, I um, do think, are actually everywhere in science. So I, this makes um, this talk indeed extremely important. Um, so how do we actually start to model? I just want to say that in a few seconds. So what we always start with is, um, in a, is an object set which um, contains all the elementary particles of our systems. So for example, in, in an epidemiological situation, that would be a certain um, population of uh, individuals. And then in a second step, the dynamic step usually is that if you have um, this classification into types, something like, for example, chemical species, um, then you see how these different types interact with each other populated by the elementary particles, which are then classified into these types. The problem is that in many cases, um, as I said, there are multi-scale problems. In this case um, appears um, typification into single flat types is not possible. You have to have hierarchical types. Hierarchical types will be types that um, contain other types from lower levels. So for example, in chemistry, you will have something like um, an molecule, which is a very, can be very complex and it contains submolecules of which it is composed of. This would be variables of lower order. And then uh, it has even, you know, um, smaller and smaller um, molecules up to the atom level. And then, um, you know, all the different molecules that are of this very complex type um, will have um, a certain amount of atoms from the basic object set. So this should um, should motivate you why you need uh, hierarchical types. And they are um, based on discrete levels here. So you um, have here 
the assumption that you have n discrete um, types in the uh, levels in the in the hierarchy. Um, you have to ask later how many objects of a certain hierarchical type are in a certain um, compartment, let's say, for example, in this one. So if this would be the same example from chemistry, you know, this could be, for example, a molecule which has um, four different uh, types of, of, um, of um, chemical species. And um, yeah, then it can be composed of, you know, of different chemical of different molecules having different amounts of chemical species. And so, um, and in the end, the, all the atoms in the universe will have, um, will be present here in this basic ob object set. And if you like to know how many there are, for example, composing this molecule with four different chemical species, you have to find a path from the lowest level of atoms um, up to this uh, hierarchical level upstairs. So this is defined as a so-called hierarchical envelope. And if um, the object set is finite um, then, and countable, then um, you can exactly say how many uh, types there are, uh, how many um, uh, basic objects there are in a certain hierarchical type. Um, let me say a little bit about um, the generalization of graph theory. What we have seen in the classification before will be a so-called hierarchical hypergraph. In order to understand what a hierarchical hypergraph is, we have first to understand what a bipartite graph is. A bipartite graph consists of two vertex sets. And if you see, if you have, for example, a type, so this would be a chemical species, um, then um, the other vertex set would be, for example, all the atoms here. And you and the link would just indicate that you are a member of this chemical species. So um, this can equivalently also be described by a hypergraph because you can just um, draw so-called hyperlinks uh, around all the chemical, uh, about all the atoms of a certain type. And so, there, so the two structures are completely equivalent. Another um, relational structure that you can use for n relations there are simplicial complexes, of course. Um, this works as well, but also simplicial complexes can in this sense not cover um, multi scale relationships such as hierarchical types where types are contained in other types uh, further above in the hierarchy. This, for this to do, you have um, to introduce your hierarchical hypergraph hierarchical hypergraph is something um, that is a generalization of um, a hypergraph. So it just adds more layers. So on top of the hypergraph, there is a hypergraph and so on. You can see that in this structure. So you start with ele elementary objects, then you have a hypergraph of level one, which um, consists of um, a, a hyperlink only containing basic objects and then you gradually build it up. But this is of course a very confusing picture, so it's better to draw this as a, as a, um, as an hyper, as a um, m partite graph. And this is mathematically actually um, exactly the same kind of thing. Here's the construction that shows or proves um, that the uh, m partite graph and the hierarchical hypergraph are mathematically equivalent. Now we go to stochastic processes. Um, here, this is like a chemical reaction, as you can see. So this is a rule which defines one event and how different hierarchical types are transformed one into the other one. So if um, this would be a classical chemical reaction, then you would not have here these outer sums, uh, which go through the hierarchical uh, levels. Um, but here they are included, and so this, um, let's say, chemical reaction-based uh, rule uh, can actually cover this multi-scale relationship. So it can have transitions which um, happen, is, are happening to the types, to the hierarchical types at different hierarchical levels at the same time when this event is triggered. So this gives you a little um, idea that you need to define updates. And uh, the only update in the system we are considering here is the so-called Gillespie algorithm, 
So let me um, go there. Um, the Gillespie algorithm is um, defined by um, two um, numbers. So here you have um, here you have um, Gillespie himself, and the Gillespie algorithm. Um, is defined by having two random numbers. One of the random numbers defines you when the next event will happen that is described by the rule I just presented. And the second um, number tells you which of the rules you have, of course, many in a, in a typical system will be executed. And then, you know, one, st one stochastic realization of the process um, looks like that. So this is an example of a simple epidemiological model. You see here one realization of a run. So let's go back to the talk. Um, so here, this explains you that we have different updates and I'm just um, here having, I'm just considering here the so-called collision update, which um, one of them is the GSP algorithm. Now let's um, end the talk with my example, which should motivate you why you need both things. One is um, the, um, well, the relational structure going beyond graphs. So we, we will have hierarchical types. And the second thing is we will have to define reasonable processes on the hierarchical types. So a good example is epidemiology. You, I'm sure you all know the classical, um, the classical um, SIR model. So here you have an infection process in the first rule, which tells you that a susceptible individual plus an infected individual um, lead to an infection. So you get two infected individuals out of that. And you have also a possible uh, recovery where an infected um, person becomes uh, recovered. Yeah, um, <laughs> becomes recovered. So now this is, of course, so far um, a system which is completely non-multiscale. So how does it become multiscale? It becomes multiscale by introducing locations into this epidemiological model. This is very important for, um, um, for COVID-19, for example. So we know that we are more effective at certain locations. So I want to go straight away here to this diagram. You see that you have um, here a, a population of individuals that are forming the basic set, set O. They have three disease states as before, which are S, I, and R. But now here you have four levels of locations. And here the first uh, level is describing closed spaces. The second level is describing buildings and infrastructure. This third level is villages, and the, and the third level will be regions. And now, on each of, in each of these locations, an infection process can take place. But of course, an infection itself will always be on the basic object level. So only human individuals can be infected. And if you uh, follow exactly these modeling guidelines, then your multi-scale um, stochastic processes exactly becomes like that. So you have the classical um, SIR model, but um, here instead of um, having only flat types, we have the reversible types. So here my 12 minutes are over. I have to stop the clock. Um, I, it, it would need a little bit more explanation now um, how such a model um, um, is, uh, is um, running smoothly. But of course, um, um, I have to skip that, and you should just be aware that um, here this is describing a process which is, is describing an infection process that has uh, possibly a very, very complex um, location structure. And so the hierarchical types here are uh, put to good use, I would say, and it's uh, also a motivating example to see that um, such hierarchical classifications make absolutely sense. Another example I could do is from chemical reaction kinetics, of course, but um, I will have to skip that due to the lack of time. So thank you very much. <laughs> okay. <Sure>. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Markus. And uh, let's go ahead with questions. 
because we we use them at the time. Yes. So please switch on your microphone and pose a question if you if you have one. Well, it doesn't doesn't seem to be the case here. Open CV in three hours. Hey everyone, welcome. To <laughs> What's that? <laughs> going to learn everything required to get this. Not exactly a question. Doesn't seem to be any question. So uh, since we run out of time, because. Uh, uh, yeah, so one thing I can do is, if you are interested in that, I mean, it's a very complex uh, topic. Um, I will, I will put you a link into the chat. Okay. So you can you can visit um, this, and then you have also a link to different uh, of these um, videos, which explain you everything in in more detail. Okay, thank you, Marcos. Please do this, and we'll go ahead with the next uh, talk. Okay. Uh, uh, this Linky Meng, if I pronounce it correctly. You uh, may share the screen. So, could I share my screen? You may share the screen and start the talk. Yeah, yeah I say share, share screen. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, could you see my screen right now? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, okay, uh, uh, it's my honor to introduce our work. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I didn't record the video, so uh, I just do it on online. Uh, so my name is Lin Kimo, and the topic today is uh, the diffusion speed of the node to micro mock on networks. And it is a joint work with Naoki Masuda, who is also my doctoral advisor. Um, so let's start from uh, the very basic results. Say, uh, suppose you have a complex network and the most common method to approach that is to consider the adjacency matrix, which is a very nice uh, precise representation. It can restore all the information from uh, the network and it is very powerful in the theoretical analysis based on, the, uh, based on this adjacency matrix representation you can do further analysis, just like uh, maybe you, you use that ranking the nodes or community detection and so on. Uh, but for computer scientists, they have some other methods to approach a network. Say they try to embed a large network into a lower dimensional Euclidean space. Uh, it is a, a approximation for the network. Uh, the, the reason for them to do that is obvious because uh, the real network is extremely large and it is a burden for computer to uh, processing. Um, suppose you have a nice graph inviting and then it will benefit the downstream tasks, uh, just like node classification, link prediction, community detection, etc. And today I want to talk about node to white random walk, which is just a, a random walk uh, algorithm uh, first used in in the graph embedding in 2016. Uh, well, actually, the reason for uh, for us to do this research is that uh, even though it is significantly used uh, in data mining, but uh, by now some theoretical research about this special random walk is pretty rare. Uh, and let's start from uh, the simple random walk. So. Uh, suppose you have a network and you have a random worker which is located in this black node. And in the next union time, it will traverse to some other nodes. Uh, for example, this node has degree four. And then for each direction, the probability is just equal to one over four. Uh, we see such a random walk is simple random walk. And it is a very simple and powerful model, of course, but the defect is also obvious. Since uh, in social or biological networks, Mm, we usually think that the neighborhoods may play a role, right? Uh, but for simple random walker, we only consider the node degree, and then that's it. Uh, we ignore some useful information. Um, so let's start talking about what is node to white. Uh, so still for the same network, and our random walker is located in this black node. And suppose in the previous union time, it was located in this white node. 
uh, at t minus one. Okay. And in the next union time, it can go backwards. Uh, I mean, return to the white node, or maybe it goes to the gray node. This gray node is a common neighborhood of the white one and the black one. So that's why I say it is common neighbor. Um, or maybe it goes to some other nodes. Uh, I just colored by right. Uh, for, for different cases, uh, I use different ways. If it is by checking, the weight is alpha. If it, is, uh, uh, if it goes to the common neighbor, the weight is beta. Otherwise, the weight is just equal to one. Uh, we can uh, represent this transition probability uh, by a formula here. And as you can see, this is a second order random walk because just within this formula, you have time t, time t minus one, and time t plus one. Uh, so comparing with the first order random walk, uh, of course, the second order one can restore more information, but in the meantime, it is mathematically not doable. Uh, we have some theoretical results about second order random walk, but uh, it is still underexplored. So uh, to deal with this problem, we used the technique which was first introduced uh, in 2014, the memory network technique. Uh, it means that instead of consider the uh, state space consisting of all the nodes, we consider the face, uh, the state space consisting of all the direct agents. Uh, suppose the network is undirected, it doesn't matter. You just consider bi-directions. Uh, for example, um, to denote the movement, from, uh, from the white node uh, to the black node. Uh, we just use this black arrow to denote this movement. And in the next union time, it, uh, it has four choices and you just use the, the blue arrow to, to denote this movement. And, and again, for different cases, you have different weights. It may be alpha, uh, it may be beta if it goes to common neighborhood, otherwise it is just equal to one. And if you think for a moment, you will realize that uh, if we consider the phase space to be all of the direct edges, then it will reduce the second order random walk into a first order Markov model. And, and you can write the transition probability matrix like this. Um, suppose you have transition probability matrix, and then of course you can do a lot of things. For example, in a theoretical study or applicational study, we always consider the stationary probability. Uh, but just be careful that the stationary probability is in terms of those direct edges. And in reality, we are more interested in the stationary probability in terms of the nodes. And, and these two probabilities can be related by the formula here. And our contribution about this special random walk is, uh, for example, uh, suppose you do, we do not distinguish uh, if it is a, the common neighborhood of these two nodes, or we do not distinguish the other nodes. Let's say, let's say this beta is just equal to one. Uh, well, well, in other words, if we just consider if this random walk is non backtracking less, uh, less easily backtracking or more frequently backtracking one, they all have the same stationary probability as the simple random walk do. Uh, recall that for the simple random walk, uh, we have a very precise formula, say uh, the stationary probability is equal to uh, d sub i over 2i, where d sub i is the, is the degree of the node i, and i is the number of the edges of the network. Uh, however, unfortunately, uh, for arbitrary network, we do not have a very precise uh, formula for, uh, for arbitrary choice of alpha and beta. Probably if you wanna find the stationary probability, what we can do is to uh, release a random walker and run simulation and use the frequency to approximate the stationary probability. Uh, but if we talk about simulation, a natural question is that uh, how fast the, the convergence is. And it comes the definition say the relaxation time. So suppose lambda two is the second largest eigenvalue of the transition probability matrix and we consider the spectral gap. Uh, we say the spectral gap is, uh, is a good measurement for the relaxation speed. More precisely, uh, if you have larger spectral gap and then you have faster relaxation speed. And we investigate uh, uh, a few uh, 
I, I, I should say various empirical networks, uh, maybe the animal, uh, animal networks or email networks or co-authorship networks. And we observe that uh, suppose you have smaller bike tracking weight or you have smaller uh, weight of visiting common neighborhoods, usually the spectral gap is larger. It means that you have faster relaxation speed, or you can say you have a uh, uh, faster convergence rate. Uh, however, for the empirical network, it is really tough to uh, do um, too much theoretical analysis. And we also considered some synthetic networks. Uh, for these two artificial uh, networks, uh, actually, the reason for us to do that is uh, it is mathematically uh, it is mathematically, uh, mathematically doable. Uh, so so uh, we still consider the spectral gap on these two special networks, and we have the similar results. Smaller alpha and the beta will induce the larger spectral gap, and we, which means that you have faster relaxation speed. Uh, and one thing uh, uh, I want to say is that uh, actually for, uh, for the empirical networks, uh, you evaluate the eigenvalues. Uh, for the large network, actually, for the commuter, it is a uh, it is a burden for computation. But for these two synthetic networks, the computational time is just fixed, and, and there is a finite finite time algorithms to evaluate uh, these spectral types, and which is just an advantage. Uh, so uh, finally, uh, well, because time is not that enough, and I just summarize uh, our contributions. Uh, so first, we just uh, do some investigate uh, about the uh, stationary probability about the uh, about this special random walk, and also we consider the diffusion speed. We review that uh, in general for empirical networks or synthetic networks, uh, smaller alpha and beta will introduce. Uh, 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 will induce a larger spectral gap. And the limitation of our research is also, uh, uh, does also exist. Uh, for example, since we use the uh, memory network technique, it means that we have to analyze the two M dimensional matrices, uh, where M again, it is the number of the direct edges. Uh, so actually, the dimension of the matrix is pretty high. And in the meantime, the transition probability matrix is not symmetric. So we do not have too many uh, mathematical toolbox to use. Uh, finally, uh, we just see some possible applications about this special random walk. Maybe in the future, it can be used in node ranking or community detections, uh, network search, and so on. Uh, finally, uh, in the end, it is, was just a small advertisement about our work. And so, so uh, if you have interest, you can uh, you can visit this article, and it is also uh, accessible from the archive. And I think that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Linky, for the for this for the talk. And uh, we are open to questions. Uh, yes. If there is anybody who wants to pose a question. I see no question in the chat, so. Well, uh, I, can, I can have a comment or question is about the application that you mentioned in your last uh, slide. And, uh, and the, the last one especially because uh, about this conduction process modeling, what is the idea here? What is the, why should one think about this node to VEC uh, random walk instead of uh, a common standard random walk. Uh, sorry, uh, I, I will uh, enlarge my volume. I'm sorry, could you please say it again? Yes, I say that uh, why should one uh, uh, design the model by using this uh, specific time of random walk that you consider here in your uh, work instead of the standard random walk? Oh, uh, so, so actually, uh, uh, actually, just uh, as what I said before, because uh, uh, in real networks, we always uh, consider that. Uh, so, 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 suppose uh, 
one node is the common neighbor of the two nodes. And then we so, somehow sometimes we prefer to think that these three nodes are strongly connected uh, to each other, right? Uh, but for simple random walks, we, we only consider the node degree uh, for the transition probability, and, and then that's it. So somehow we ignore the neighborhood information for the, that network. And that's why uh, I say maybe uh, it can be useful uh, for the contagion process modeling. Uh, for example, the contagion process usually we consider about the, the society, right? The society network. Okay, thank you. There is a question actually in the chat, so we can take this question as well. Uh, Lucrezia is asking, how is the stationary probability involved in the embedding space? Uh, actually, uh, I think uh, it, uh, it also occurs some in, in some other people's work. Uh, uh, they, they, uh, uh, so, 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 uh, uh, in this node to work, uh, in this node to work uh, sampling strategy, uh, I, uh, if my memory is, uh, serves me faithfully, uh, the, uh, well, let's see what I can say. Uh, it, uh, it, the, the samples, uh, the sample process is finite. But if uh, if the, the sample process is infinite, then it will converge to the stationary probability. Uh, uh, yeah, it will converge to the stationary probability in that sense. And uh, so, so, so actually, uh, it tells you that uh, uh, the the probability of each node to be sampled, and maybe. Uh, because uh, you do sampling and, and that uh, actually that sampling is always to be the biased sampling, right? And suppose you know the decision of probability, uh, maybe you can remove those bias, or maybe you can, uh, for example. So Lucrezia, unless we hear or, uh, okay, it seems that you are satisfied with the answer. That's nice. Thank you very much, uh, Linku, for your talk. And we go ahead to the next and last uh, talk of uh, Anastasia. Uh, Salova. Okay, thank you so much and thanks for your time. Okay. Hello, uh, so I have a pre recorded video and okay. I'll share it. Go Please ahead. You let me know if there are any technical issues. Um, okay. Does it not? Can you see my screen? Okay, yeah, perfect. I don't know why it's not playing right now. It's a video that was playing earlier. Mm. Sorry. You checked it before and it was uh, it was really playing in your computer, but now yes, yes. Uh, so so let me just try it again real quick. Yeah. Try it again and if it doesn't work, then you may yeah, then I'll just have to present yes. uh, in real time. Sorry about this issue. You are aware that you do not share the screen now with us, eh? With my advisor, Professor Reiser D'Souza. Okay. Yeah, please share the screen and uh, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just do it uh, in real time, sorry.
Sorry, just one second. All right. Uh, okay, I can. I hope you can at least see my screen. Yes. Um, my name is Anastasia Salva. I'm a graduate student at University of California, Davis, and I want to present the work I've done with my advisor, Raisa D'Souza, on cluster synchronization and hypergraphs. Um, so, of course, many natural and engineered systems are modeled as networks with purely data interactions. But in some cases, it's more useful to model the systems as hypergraphs. And some of the examples include ecological networks, co-authorship networks with multiple authors per paper, um, neural, neuronal networks, chemical networks, etc. It also includes some processes such as epidemic or rumor spreading between groups of people. Um, but the process I'm particularly interested in for the purposes of this talk is synchronization, in which um, nodes that are coupled to each other after some time um, fully synchronize and follow the same trajectory in time. Uh, first, let me introduce cluster synchronizations for systems with static interactions, which is of course very well studied in literature. Um, we define the state of each node in our system by x, i, where i labels the node, and the dynamics of this node um, can be described in terms of its self-evolution defined by the function f um, and the uh, coupling function part, which consists of the um, adjacency matrix A, J, with elements equal to one if the nodes are connected zero otherwise, and the coupling function G. Uh, additionally, we assume that the coupling function G vanishes if the nodes involved in it are fully synchronized. And uh, because of this condition, for any network topology, the fully synchronized state is admissible. But in addition to the fully synchronized state, we can also observe some of the more intricate patterns of synchronization in such systems. And one of them is called cluster synchronization. In case of cluster synchronization, uh, a part of the nodes in the network are fully synchronized. So for instance, teal nodes are synchronized with each other, but they're not fully synchronized with some other parts of the network, for instance, the yellow nodes. Um, in this example, we can see that each yellow node gets one input from violet node, two inputs from black nodes, etc. So the input each node gets only depends on what cluster it belongs to. And therefore, um, yeah, so the partition of the nodes that satisfies that condition is called an equitable partition. In addition, we can ignore the edges between the fully synchronized nodes. So uh, considering the external equitable partition is sufficient. Based on that partition, we can construct a quotient network that corresponds to the effective interactions between the clusters of synchronization um, and the dynamics of each cluster can, of course, be written down in terms of its own dynamics and the dynamics of the other clusters. So, so far I've talked about dynamics on um, dyadic networks. Cluster synchronization can also be observed in hypergraphs. So um, the hypergraph uh, not only has dyadic edges, but also higher order interactions, in this case, triadic interactions shown in blue. And the dynamics can now be written down in terms of um, either the incidence matrices of each order of interaction or the adjacency tensors that go beyond the um, adjacency matrices. Just for this example, I show the um, incidence matrices for dyadic and triadic interactions. And their elements correspond to um, what node belongs to which edges. For instance, we can see a second node belongs to edge one, two, but not the edge one, four. 
We can observe cluster synchronization on hypergraphs as well um, to determine whether a pattern is admissible. We can first divide the nodes into different clusters shown in different colors in the incidence matrix. And then that partition induces the partition of edges. So now um, we can cluster the edges as well. For instance, the teal yellow edges form their own cluster. And now we expect that uh, each node in a given cluster gets the same input from all the edge orders for dyadic and triadic interactions in this example. So uh, the partition into clusters is not unique, of course. So for the example I'm showing, um, here are four of the admissible patterns. Some other patterns are admissible too. But here I show the pattern of full synchronization, synchronization with two clusters, four clusters, and eight clusters. And we can keep track of what node belongs to what cluster by constructing the uh, indicator matrices corresponding to each cluster denoted by E. So cluster synchronization on hypergraphs is different from cluster synchronization on projected networks. And this is the example illustrating that. So we can project all the hyper edges of the hypergraph onto the attic edges. And we can see that in that case, we get an admissible pattern of uh, synchronization for a hypergraph projection where yellow nodes get the same inputs, but that is not the case for the original hypergraph. So um, the patterns of synchronization are not the same in those two cases. In addition, we want to be able to uh, not only determine the admissible patterns, but see which of these patterns can be observed in natural or engineered systems for given parameter values. Uh, to do that, we need to perform the stability calculation that I will demonstrate in the next slides. So for the stability calculation, we're required to consider the uh, Jacobian of the system that determines the evolution of the perturbation, perturbations um, away from the synchronized state. The Jacobian has the self terms again, which correspond to the derivatives um, of the self evolution functions. And uh, it also has sets of terms corresponding to each of the coupling orders. For each coupling order, we also need to consider all the synchronization patterns that are available for the edges of that order and sum over those. Um, the other thing we need is the Laplacian matrix corresponding to each of the synchronization patterns I'll discuss in the next slide and the uh, partial derivatives of the coupling functions with respect to each node. To calculate the um, Laplacian matrix corresponding to each of the patterns of synchronization, we need to um, select the columns of the uh, incidence matrix corresponding to a particular synchronization pattern, multiply it by its transverse, um, subtract some of the diagonal elements and obtain the Laplacian matrix for a given synchronization pattern. Finally, um, in some high dimensional systems, it's challenging to perform the stability calculation for the full network or hypergraph. And then for therefore it's useful to be able to block diagonalize the Jacobian to simplify the stability calculations. So it has already been done for networks with dyadic interactions. Um, we apply a similar method here, except instead of just considering the adjacency matrix and the indicator matrices for each of the clusters, we now consider those matrices in addition to Laplacian or adjacency matrices for each pattern of higher order interactions. In this example, I'm showing two of the cluster synchronization states. On the right, I'm showing the block Jacobian obtained by simultaneously block diagonalizing the matrices shown in the second and the third column. The pink block corresponds to the um, parallel perturbations and the blue blocks correspond to the transfer perturbations that provide us the maximum Lapinov exponent. So we can see that going from the four cluster to the two cluster pattern, the uh, parallel perturbation block shrinks and we get more transverse perturbation blocks. So finally, um, I want to show a concrete example of a stability calculation, in which case we have two rings of seven nodes coupled to each other. Um, 
one node in each ring uh, is connected to one node in the other ring. We get second, next nearest neighbor, and nearest neighbor coupling within each ring. And we also couple the nearest neighbors through the hyper edges. We perform the Jacobian block diagonalization to perform the stability calculation shown in the right column. And we, the pink corresponds to the stability region of our system. Uh, the green lines correspond to doing the direct simulation to uh, verify the results. Some of the interesting things we can observe, for example, are that uh, for low dyadic coupling, sigma two, uh, we require uh, non-zero triadic coupling for the system to be stable, even though the triadic term appears to be repulsive in the equation. Just to summarize, I've shown how we can obtain the admissible patterns of synchronization on hypergraphs using the uh, external equitable partition, how we can perform the stability calculations for such systems, how we can modify the stability calculation by block diagonalizing the Jacobian. And finally, our setup will allow us to understand how higher order interactions within clusters or between different clusters can stabilize or destabilize the synchronization patterns, which would be our future work. Finally, I want to thank Adolson Modern and Yan Zhao Zhang for um, discussions on the topic. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Anastasia. And uh, we are open uh, to questions, if there are any questions. You may also write in the chat. Uh, meanwhile, let me ask you a, a, a detailed question in the uh, next to the last slide where you had this uh, uh, form of the equations down there. So the J, these, uh, uh, the J's are the neighbors only to I, right? And the same yes. for the K. So you only yeah. the closest uh, uh, neighbor, the nearest neighbors. Yeah. So. Um... I chose the neighbors that are shown on this uh, hypergraph structure image. So I have coupling between first and second nearest neighbors within each ring, each node of the ring coupled one to one node in another ring. And I also added the higher order interactions between the neighbors, yes. Okay. And the, the stability you consider it with, with respect to the uh, sigma parameters. Uh, Yes. Like. Yes. So uh, sigma three is the coupling between the nearest neighbors on the triadic edge, and sigma two is the coupling between the neighbors on the dyadic edge. What I didn't mention is that the coupling strengths are different within and between clusters, but we can still see uh, this pattern stable for some of the parameters if all the couplings are the same strengths in the dyadic interactions. Okay, I think this is a nice example because you showed earlier this uh, two clusters, four, eight clusters, and that it was not uh, really obvious how you uh, deal with the equations for this. But you have generated, you have made simulations with more than two clusters, right? Yes, yeah, so in that case, it will just be a bit messier because there is a lot of multi stability involved. So that's why I'm showing this simpler example for now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, if there are any questions, please. Yes, I, I have. Ah, sorry, sorry, I monopolized again. Yes, yes, go ahead. Turn, uh, switch on your microphone, please. And, uh... Yeah, it's, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, ah, Ricardo, okay, yeah, okay, sorry. Thank you for the, the talk. Uh, um, can, you, can you do the same analysis if you put directionality in your networks, for example, in between the two modular structure? Yeah, so um, I haven't looked at it in detail. I can do the analysis of finding the admissible clusters, but the block diagonalization would be more tricky for directed networks. So I'm not exactly sure how I would approach that. Okay. And yeah, based on your talk, directionality could also make the yeah. uh, calculating the Lapinov exponent more complicated. Most of the time, it's still diagonalizable, even if it's directed, even non normal, it's still diagonalizable. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess uh, I wouldn't be sure how to do the simultaneous block diagonalization because there hasn't been as much work on that for directed networks. But other than that, the analysis would still work. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK. Uh, doesn't seem to be any other question here. 
So I thank uh, all the speakers uh, for being uh, very concise in their talks that we have been very well in time. And uh, for all of you for, who participated, uh, thank you all. And I now close the session. And if you want to discuss, of course, you know it's how to do it uh, to, with each other. You have all the details in the web page. So thank you. Bye-bye.